Hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss semiconductors, but we are going to do this in the context of the energy from our sun. So the day old question, the age old question I should always say, is that the students want to know, can we just or only use solar energy to power our planet? And really the answer is maybe? someday, eventually, but right now the answer is no. It is extraordinarily difficult. And just to give you a frame of reference for what we're currently using, here in the United States, so in the US, we have less than 1% of our total energy is from solar energy. Okay, so not very much at all. Less than 1% of every single way that we get our energy to turn on the lights in your house and your school and work and whatever, it less than 1% comes from solar energy. So we right now are not doing a very good job of it. And there actually is a pretty good reason why. So it turns out that if we look at a map of a daily sunlight, okay, so this is a, a picture of the United States and the red colors is showing the areas that have a lot of sunlight every single day and the purple and dark colors are showing the places that have the least amount of sunlight every single day. It's a daily matter, okay? So the first thing I want to point out is that we have two sections that right away I can see barely receive any sunlight. So we've got Washington here over on the left side, and then we've got Alaska here at the bottom, which we all know is actually up at the top, but it is definitely something that does not receive a lot of sunlight. So right away we know in Alaska and maybe in the corner of Washington, a little bit in Oregon there, they are just not going to be able to use solar energy as much as somebody like California or Arizona or New Mexico. So like all over here in this bright red section or even West Texas, we receive a lot of energy every single day. And so it's certain places that solar energy would be a more viable option. But realistically, big picture, because we don't all work together as a country and all use energy just as one big group and we do it individually, solar energy is really, really difficult. And that's just because we don't receive a lot of it. And and remember, the Earth's axes and the rotation and how we orbit around the sun, it all has to come all back to that. But we already studied this, so I'm not going to bore you with that again. Now, the best option, if you want to actually try to use solar energy, so our best way or our best resources are spent on this right now, is to create semiconductors. Okay, so semiconductors are the way to go if you are absolutely sure that you want to use solar energy. So now, what is a semiconductor? A semiconductor is essentially a material or materials, depending on what you're talking about, with a limited capacity of conducting an electric current. So it's limited. Okay, you don't want something that can conduct electricity really, really well and super quickly, but you also don't want something that cannot conduct electricity. You want those people, the people, the metals that are somewhere in between, okay? So now, our best option, if we're going to really focus in on semiconductors, our best semiconductor are made of crystalline, silicon. Okay, so SI. So we just use crystalline silicon. And so essentially what we have though is silicon that is unbelievably pure. So it's purified from silicon dioxide. So what I think or hopefully you are starting to realize is that a lot of times we don't have just sodium metal or silicon metal just sitting around in our planet. What we have are a bunch of oxides. Same with uranium. When we focus on uranium, we always have to extract it in uranium ore, which is an oxide, okay? So we start with some metal, we purify it, and then once we have this metal for our semiconductor, especially silicon, then we can continue on. But before I tell you anything else about semiconductors, we need to make sure that we can label this properly. So is silicon a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. Go. All right, did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, but if you didn't, that's okay. This is something we learned a long time ago, so you probably had to dig down and deep into those cobwebs and try to brush everything off and find the answer. So hopefully you were, after a little bit of research, maybe able to determine that it was definitely a metalloid. So let's get down some properties of silicon here. So silicon is in group four, which means it has four valence electrons. It sits underneath carbon, 
so you know exactly where it's sitting and should be very, very similar or operate in a similar similar manner, matter as carbon. And we also just said that it's a metalloid. And so what you'll start to realize is that very good semiconductors often are metalloids. They don't have properties just like metals. They don't have properties just like nonmetals. They're somewhere in between. They have this beautiful properties that make them wonderful semiconductors or make them um, have these properties that allow for current to pass through, but not super, super well or not horribly slow. So it's this really unique unique property. They kind of flirt that line. So let's look at a picture of silicon just to start off with. So you can see here that these gray dots, those are your silicon atoms. So right here, this is a single silicon atom. And then we know that it has four valence electrons around them. So one, two, three, and four. But then what we see is that there's four other electrons around it. So just like carbon, it wants to have a complete octet. It wants to have eight electrons around it. So what it does is it shares four electrons from neighboring silicon atoms. So here's one, it takes them from here and from here. Okay, so this is a basic structure. It's a ton of silicon just mapped together. It's just nice and flat and planar. It, each silicon atom brings four electrons to the table, and then together they're able to complete their octets. Okay, so these red dots are the electrons. The grays are the silicon atoms. I'm explaining this, this ludicrously slow because it's about to get complicated. Because here is what happens, okay? Same picture. Gray dots are still silicon. Red dots are still electrons. So now for this specific example, what we have is a red electron here that is hit by a photon, okay? So it's hit by a photon, and then what happens, so it's right here, hit by a photon, and then the electron moves. So it travels along this line, and now all of a sudden you have this free electron. So this electron, all right, you've got your, your silicon here, the energy comes in, hits the electron, the electron's like, woo, I love it, grabs the energy and shoots across the metal, or shoot, shoots across the surface to neighboring silicon atoms. So you have this current, right? Anytime your electron is moving across the surface, that's what gives you your current or it allows for the flow of electrons, okay? So this process is great because now we have an, a, a free electron, we have an additional electron right here, but back at the beginning right here, now what we have what is called a positive hole, which means no electron. You have an absence of an electron, which we call a hole. So an electron's negative. If you remove the electron away, you're left with a positive hole. Okay. So there's nothing there, but it's kind of positive because we've lost the charge. Hopefully that makes sense. So now what we need to do is look at a map because realistically a map, a periodic table, because realistically semiconductors are never just used in their pure elemental state. They are always doped. Okay. So let's talk about doping really quickly. So doping, let's get a definition. Doping is the addition of other elements to semiconductors, but since we're just going to focus on silicon, I'm going to make this definition for us. So of other elements to pure silicon here, okay? So what we need to do here is look at our periodic table, and the first thing we need to do is figure out where silicon is. And so silicon is right here, like we said, underneath carbon, it has a plus four, all right? Four electrons around there, so we don't even need to say plus four, but it has four electrons around it. Now, what we need to do is look at neighboring elements. So I'm gonna draw your attention to gallium, which is one less, so the gallium has three valence electrons, and then I'm also going to draw your attention to arsenic. Oops, see if I can get my pen there. Arsenic, which has five valence electrons. So arsenic has one more than silicon, and gallium has one less than silicon. This is important. I know that feels silly in elementary and rudimentary, but this is something that's very important. So when you dope a metal or you dope a semiconductor, you need to add an element that has a different number of valence electrons. So if I added carbon to a silicon semiconductor that has the same number of valence electrons, it would be a waste of time. Okay, so let me show you, starting off with arsenic first. So we said arsenic has five valence electrons, so it's one extra electron. So what we've done here is we have this green one right here, this green circle, that's an arsenic atom. And so what you can see is that there's an extra electron that has been inserted into this silicon system. So now all of a sudden we have one extra electron, which means there's an extra negative charge there. So giving this system a negative or taking that away, which would be positive doping. So N type doping here, giving it a negative allows for that flow of current and it becomes this much better semiconductor or an optimal se semiconductor. So because this has an extra electron, we would call this an N-type semiconductor. 
okay? So any element that we added that is in that group five, if we added that to silicon, is going to be considered an N-type semiconductor because we've added an electron. There's an extra electron. Now the opposite of this, so still going back to plain old silicon, there's no arsenic in this. The opposite of this system would be if we added gallium. So this time, our little orange one right here, gallium has one less electron. So let's write this out. Gallium, it is in group three. So it has one less electron, always comparing to silicon. So instead of having an electron right here where it should, where the silicon atom does, we have what is called a hole. All right, so that's that positive piece just sitting there, which allows, there's like a positive charge, so it, it's a beacon, it's calling out for these other electrons. So as soon as sunlight comes in, it's absorbed in the semiconductor, that energy is able to move through these doped semiconductors because there's a pathway. There's either a hole waiting for some electrons electrons to go, or there's another electron which would basically redirect the energy. So now, for gallium, instead of being an N-type semiconductor, this would be considered a P-type semiconductor. So any element that you add to silicon that has one less electron, so anything from group three is going to be considered a P-type semiconductor because it has one less electron, okay? I hope this is making sense. It is kind of a tricky subject, but just you have to put some time into it, focus, sit down and talk to your neighbors, get a study group, but you need to understand this process. It is very complicated, okay? So what I wanna do now is ask you two questions to see if you actually understand this, all right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to add indium to pure silicon, okay, to create a doped semiconductor. So now, if we add indium, is that going to be an N-type or is it going to be a P-type? Okay, so that's what I want to know. And the second question is going to be, what happens if we add antimony to pure silicon, okay? Again, we're trying to create either an N or a P-type conductor, and so I want to know the difference. Is indium N or P? Is antimony N or P? Go. All right, did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, but if you didn't, that's okay. The way you need to approach this problem is start off by looking at what's called the dopant. All right, what are you adding to the silicon? And the big thing you need to see is on the periodic table, is it in the same group of silicon? Is it before it or is it after it? And so if you looked at a periodic table, you would be able to see that indium is in group three. So it has one less electron than silicon. So this is definitely going to be a P type semiconductor. And so just as a way of kind of remembering it, I always like to think of my P-type semiconductors as positive semiconductors. They have one less electron, all right? So now what we can do is look at indium. So you find indium on the periodic table, and the first thing you would see is that it's in group five. So that means you have one more electron than silicon does. If you have one more electron, that means this definitely has to be an N-type or a negative semiconductor, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. You need to practice this. Study, study, study. Good luck, study, take care of yourself, drink water.